I would say that although, uh, as shown by this statement, there is opposition to specific scientific ideas within Western Christianity, uh, there's not really an opposition to the idea of science itself, only to some of its conclusions. I think this is different in the world of Islam. And it's, it's really quite tragic because, as, as we know, Islam led the world in, the ninth, in science in the ninth century at a time uh, I mean, the, the famous statement by Philip Hitty in his book about the Arabs that uh, the caliphs al-Mamun and al-Rashid were delving into Greek philosophy and science at a time when Charlemagne and his nobles were struggling with the art of writing their names. Um, many of the scientists of, the, uh, of this great period of Islamic science, science were rather non-religious. Uh, some of them, like Razi's, actually hostile to religion, although some, I, I must say, like Al-Tuzi and Avicenna were, were quite religious. But it was a mixed picture. Uh, but then there was a reaction against science in the Islamic world in the 12th century. And it was not a reaction so much against any one particular conclusion of science as against the very idea of laws of nature. Uh, because it was felt that lo the laws of nature put God's hands in chains. This was particularly uh, the view of an influential philosopher, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, who wrote a book, uh, The Incoherence of the Philosophers. Uh, he rejected the idea of the laws of nature. He explained, for example, that if you put a piece of cotton in the fire and it turns black and smolders, it's not because of the heat, it's because God wants it to turn black and smolder. Everything is a special occasion for the will of God. Whether it was Al-Ghazali's influence or, or whatever, or perhaps the uh, depression due to military defeats in Spain, Islamic si science really ended uh, at the, by the end of the uh, 12th century. And um, today we have the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt that calls for an end of education in science. I had a, a dear friend, now no longer with us, Abdus Salam, uh, a Pakistani, uh, although like all scientists I know of Muslim origin who do significant work, he was educated and works in the West, not in Muslim countries. Uh, he tried for many years to get the oil-rich states of the Persian Gulf uh, to invest in universities, including science education, and he found that um, they were quite open to the idea of technology, but tried to divorce it from fundamental science, because they f felt that fundamental science uh, would pose problems for their religious faith. My feeling is they were probably right about that. Uh, I want to call something to your attention that we all know, uh, um, we all know intuitively, whether or not you've thought about it explicitly. You go around the world and you find times and places where nations have excelled in one subject or another. There's a birth of that period of, of where they excel and then there's a peak and sometimes it drops off and sometimes they hang on. And so you can ask the culture of that. What was going on in that nation to support those discoveries? And then what happened when they ended? And so I, I call that sort of naming rights. If you were there first and you did it best, you name things. Particle physics uh, in this country, in the United States, was like going gangbusters after the Second World War. And, and the discovery of atomic elements, look at the periodic table. There's Berkelium, Californium, you know, we got half the United States up there in the upper, heavier elements of the periodic table. Uh, am I right there? Sir, Sir Weinberg. No, I don't want to. <laughs> that's, that's not because the world liked California or Berkeley, it's because the work was done here. It's because there was, a, there was a, um, an effort to excel in just those subjects. And it shows up in other ways, well, I'll give you just briefly, you know, um, part of the naming rights is that you don't have to name it. So for example, while we didn't invent the internet, we certainly exploited it here in America, we did that sort of first and best, and so your email address does not end in .us. Everybody else is in the world. They got to say what country they came from. We don't. Okay? 
It's, it's simple, but it's, it's the consequence of being there first and doing it better than anyone had done it before. Do you know that the British postage stamp is the only postage stamp in the world that does not identify the country of origin? Because they invented postage stamps. <laughs> so why should they have to say what country it is? It's their invention. Okay? Check them out. It's, a, it's, it's just the facts of this. The constellations of the night sky. We, it's the Greek and Roman, and it's lasted to this time. Because they did a really good job thinking that stuff up. All the mythologies of the heavens, that really stuck with us. All right, so I'm going to make a larger point. Um, not to get gratuitous on you here, but September 11, 2001, uh, as we all know, this was going on uh, in New York City. Uh, this is the view outside of my window. I live four blocks from ground zero. Excuse me, this is the corner of the building in which I live. I went outside to get this view. I was at the time judging whether I should go collect my daughter, who was in an elementary school two blocks north of the North Tower. North is to the right in this picture. So I wanted to get a closer view with a highly magnified uh, zoom lens to see what, while that was happening, the plane flew into the South Tower. And so no one was thinking terrorism until the second one was hit. The first one was just sort of a bad tragedy. And so these are just three frames from my camcorder. This is at t equals zero. This is one second. Well, like actually a fraction of a second. The plane was moving probably 500 miles an hour. And just to understand, the black building, that black sort of monolithic building, that is 50 stories tall. This is New York City, people. So tall buildings are kind of, they're just all over the place. And that's just a hotel, a 50-story hotel. And it's, the, the, the towers are foreshortened because they're the angle at which this is shown. I put these up because a few days after this, President Bush I don't remember where he said this, on the steps of the White House, in the Rose Garden or at the Capitol, in an attempt to distinguish we from they, the terrorists who flew these planes into the buildings and into the, uh, uh, went down in Pennsylvania and at the, at, in Washington, to distinguish we from they, he loosely qu quotes a phrase out of the Bible by saying, our God is the God who named the stars. Now, this is before I was on his Rolodex, okay? Uh, because I could have helped him out there. The fact is, of all the stars that have names, two-thirds of them have Arabic names. So this was not, I don't think, his intent with that message. Okay? <laughs> While the constellations are Greek and Roman, the names are Arabic, all right? And the list just goes on, and on, and on, and on. And so where does this come from? How, does, how, do, how do you get us, how does this happen? How do you get stars named with Arabic names? How does this happen? And it happens because, of course, because, hang on, just catching up with myself here. Okay? It happens because there was this particularly fertile period that um, Professor Weinberg duly discussed. Um, and around that period, that 300-year period, the intellectual center of the world was Baghdad. Baghdad. It was completely open to all visitors, all travelers, Jews, Christians, uh, doubters, which today we might call atheists. They were all there exchanging ideas, all of them. All of them. And it was that period where you had the advances in like engineering and, and biology and medicine and, and, and mathematics. All right? Our numerals are called what? Arabic numerals. They ever stop and think about that? You know, who's, who, as in America, do we pause, take pause at this? Why are they called Arabic numerals? Okay, they fully exploit the, the discovery of the zero, create a whole field called algebra, itself an Arabic word. Algorithm is an Arabic word. All this is going on, and it's all traceable, not to some long thousand-year tradition in, the, in Islam. It's traceable to this 300-year period. This 300-year period. And then, so they had naming rights. The most expensive, beautifully uh, carved astrolabes come out of this period. There's a great collection of these at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, if you ever want to check them out. So navigation, celestial navigation, all of this is traceable to this period. And so something happened. 
And what happened, as was previously described, I was told, and I give, forgive me for repeating from what you might have heard, 12th century kicks in, and then you get the influence of this scholar, Al-Ghazali, all right? And so, so out of his work, you get the philosophy that mathematics is the work of the devil. And nothing good can come of that philosophy. That combined with other sort of codification, philosophical codifications of what Islam would, was and would become, the entire intellectual foundation of that enterprise collapsed, and it has not recovered since. Over that period, all these books were translated into Arabic on a scale not seen since then. If you're a historian, typically you, are, you're, you, are, you focus on history as marked by changes of kings and leaders and wars. That's the lens through which many historians look at the past. And so if you ask people, they'll say, oh, the Mongols sacked Baghdad, and so that's why it all ended. If that were the only force operating, then later, when the Islamic culture rose, you would still see this tradition of scientific um, uh, uh, innovation. But it has not recovered. It has not come back at all. Of it. But we all know tomorrow's economies will be founded on, uh, on, on innovations in science and technology, and of course that gets cut short if uh, we lose our civilization as what happened in Islam in 1100. And the last thought I'll leave you with, which concerns me greatly, if you do the math, okay, you know, just look, you look at all the Nobel Prize winners there ever were, some even in this room, and ask how many were Muslim? And it's like one, maybe two, okay? I think a second one was in economics. And the one we referred to was uh, an, uh, described earlier, the co-winner of the Nobel Prize with Professor Weinberg, uh, Abdus Salam. And he's not Middle Eastern Muslim, he's Pakistani Muslim, <coughs> okay? Now, how many Nobel Prizes are won by Jews? It's like the fourth of the Nobel Prizes, okay? Some high fraction of the total. And then you look, how many Muslims are there in the world? It's like a billion Muslims. How many Jews? 15 million tops, okay? So you to ratio these numbers, had Islam not collapsed in its intellectual standing in the year 1100, and you just do the ratios, they would have every single Nobel Prize today. So the fact that it's not only just a few, it's near zero, it is deeply worrying. I'm concerned about what lost, what, 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 what brilliance may have expressed itself and did not in that community over the past thousand years. So, lecture given by Neil, uh, which I enjoyed immensely, but there's one minor point of disagreement. Uh, I think he got something factually incorrect, and that is he talked about the glories of the Arab civilization, about Baghdad, which I agree with wholeheartedly, but then he referred to Arabic numerals, that they invented the number system as we know it with zero and numbers. In fact, these should be called Indian numerals. <laughs> They actually originated in India in the second century AD and then were transmitted to the Arabs and from there to the, to the West. And Western scholars therefore refer to it as, as Arabic numerals. Um, but you know, that doesn't contradict the spirit of what you're saying, which I agree with.